I would like to introduce you our first speaker of today, Radhika Dutt. So, Radhika is an influential author of the book Radical Product Thinking, the New Mindset for Innovating Smarter. She is an entrepreneur, product leader, and advises diverse organizations on creating revolutionary products. She co-founded Radical Product Thinking and speaks at prominent events worldwide. Today, she'll joining us here on stage with the topic, Transform Your Organization to Build World-Changing Products. Please help me, join me, help me uh, welcoming Radhika here on stage with a enormous round of applause. Let's speak up to you. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad the energy levels are higher than expected. <laughs> um, true to the name radical, we are going to be challenging some conventional ideas. So we're going to be talking about how we can transform our organizations to build world-changing products. And when it comes to transformation, right, we so often hear the term, we have to be product-led, that we have to go through this product-led transformation. And you know, let's start with the radical idea that I really dislike the word product-led. And I'll start with, why did this word product-led even come about, right? It's because traditionally organizations have been either engineering-led or they've been sales-led. You know, engineering-led organizations are the ones that typically built solutions that were then searching for problems. Right? How many of us have worked in companies where we talked about use cases? <laughs> That's exactly the definition of engineering-led, where we build technologies and then we look for use cases for them. And on the other hand, you have sales-led organizations. Right? The sales-led organizations basically say, whatever the customer wants, just whatever they want, let's just go build it. As long as it brings in revenues, let's go build it. Right? And so, what companies realized over time, that either of these extremes is really hard to scale. And so, product-led came up as the balance between being engineering-led or sales-led. But if you've used the words product-led at your company, most likely you've faced this mini-revolt. Right? Your marketing team or your sales team, engineering team, everyone will say, wait a minute. You know, why product-led? I thought we're supposed to be customer-led, right? When you use the words product-led, it sounds like this is a power dynamic, that you're trying to assert power from the product organization. And so, what has happened is, by calling it product-led, actually, the path has not been any clearer. And so, what we need to do to clarify that path is actually start by using the right terminology. So let's not call it product-led. Transformation starts by creating clarity around what are we transforming to? And the answer to that for me is being vision-driven. That's what we want to be, right? We want to be vision-driven. So let's talk about what that means. Because until now, you know, we haven't really learned a process for being vision-driven. What we've learned so far is that the right way to build products is you have to, above all, iterate quickly. And our mantras for innovation have been, you know, you have to build, test, learn, scale. Uh, you have to fail fast, learn fast. But above all, as long as you iterate quickly, that's how your product is going to be successful and then hopefully make lots of money, right? Here's the reality, though. While we have focused on methodologies like Lean and Agile, which have helped us iterate faster, they've helped us innovate faster by driving faster, right? So these methodologies, they give us speed. And it's fantastic to have speed. This is not a criticism of speed, but speed alone is not enough. And so what happens? People say, oh, what we need in addition to speed is let's ask customers what they want, right? But asking customers for what they want, that's the equivalent of driving fast, and then you stop, roll down your windows, and ask for directions along the way. 
But when we step back for a moment, right, what we realize is before we actually start driving or before we stop and ask someone for directions, we are in the driver's seat as product people. And when you're in the driver's seat, you have to know where you want to go, your final destination, and roughly how you're going to get there. And only then is it useful to have a fast car, and only then is it useful to stop and ask for directions. Because when we just have speed, right? Speed often looks like this. It looks like chaos, where you have everyone moving fast, but in different directions. And so this chaos, the way it manifests itself in our organizations is in what I call product diseases. So since these product diseases are so common, and honestly, I have experienced these product diseases myself, and no matter where I worked, I've worked in so many industries, ranging from broadcast, telecom, media and entertainment, advertising, robotics, even wine. Right? And, and it was across a wide range of sizes of companies, all the way from startups to multinationals to government organizations. And I've come across these same set of product diseases over and over. So let's do a checkup and tell me if you've seen these diseases too. And there's no shame in sharing diseases, there's solidarity. So let's start by talking about sales-led companies and the most common diseases I see there. And this one is probably my favorite disease. It's called obsessive sales disorder. Right? Obsessive sales disorder happens when your salesperson comes to you and they have a glimmer in their eye and they say to you, you know, if you just add this one custom feature for me, we can win this mega client. And this sounds mostly harmless because they promise we're not going to turn it on for others. And so we say, yes, let's do it. And pretty soon, by the end of the year, you know, you're sitting with a stack of contracts and your entire roadmap is driven by all that you have to make good on, right? How many of us have seen obsessive sales disorder? Excellent, thank you. This is one I contributed to, so. Let's talk about common diseases in engineering-led organizations. I think the most common one is narcissist complex. Right? Narcissist complex happens when we're so focused on looking inwards, thinking about our own goals and, you know, what we need that we become disconnected from what actually our customers need. And I think the worst case um, that I had experienced until recently was when an executive at a group of hospitals in the US, when this executive said, you know, for us to be successful, we need our patients to come back often. <laughs> Forgetting what this means for actually the patients, right? But let's not make it seem like being engineering-led or sales-led is actually mutually exclusive, because you can actually be both at the same time. And so here are some common diseases that happen in both, and both when they're together. It's pivotitis. Some of you are laughing because you've experienced this, right? You know before I even describe it what it is. <laughs> pivotitis happens when our company feels like we're constantly in the search of the next shiny object. When we switch from one nice idea to the next, and especially in a sales-led organization, this feels like one sprint to the next, we're working on whichever company is, whichever client is screaming the loudest, we work on whatever they want, right? And then this disease is strategic swelling. This is when your product starts out well and your customer says, you know, I have an idea for your product. If you add this one feature, I could also use your product to do blah. And that sounds good, so you add that feature. And next they say, oh, we also have another idea. And this other customer says, you know, you can add this feature and we could do this too. And so pretty soon you add more and more features and your product is doing everything for everyone and it'll even make you coffee if you just ask nicely, right? Your product becomes so bloated you no longer recognize it. Anyone see strategic swelling? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so why do these diseases happen? I mentioned that it happens when we have speed. It happens specifically when we have speed without direction, right? When our iterations are not driven by a clear vision and strategy. When we're not being vision-driven. 
And so what we know from high school physics is we want not speed, but speed plus um, direction so that that's how, you know, everyone in the organization is pointing in the same direction and that's how we get forward velocity. And that is where radical product thinking comes in. It's a methodology for building world-changing products and it gives us a step-by-step -step approach so that we can align our organizations and add direction to our execution. And in the radical product thinking way, it means that, you know, instead of just iterating quickly, we engineer change. That your product is your mechanism for creating the change you want to bring. And so engineering change means starting with this clarity of what's the change you want to bring about, meaning the vision. Then translating that into a strategy or a set of actionable steps then into a set of priorities, then execution and measurement where what we measure is derived from our strategy. And then finally, we can use all of these ideas to also create the culture that we need for innovation. And in the radical product thinking way, all of these elements are engineered as communication tools so that we can bring everyone with us on the journey. But at this point, you, you would be fair to ask. You know, you promised something radical. Every word you've used so far, vision, strategy, we've heard these words before, right? We know we need a good vision, we need strategy. So what is radical about this? And so to illustrate that, I really want to share with you the example of DC versus Marvel. Let's start with the story of DC. DC actually has been a sales-led organization. The way they've made movies has been always looking at the short term, chasing yearly summer blockbusters. And so how did this manifest in their product, right? Oh, I'll talk about first, how did it manifest in their vision and strategy? When you have this sales-led approach, the way we use our vision and the way it manifests in our vision is this broad vision that essentially means Let's just do whatever brings in revenues. And our strategy basically says, what brings in revenues? Let's do more of that. Right? That's how we use vision and strategy in a sales-led organization. And how does that manifest in a product? Well, in 1989, DC came up with Batman. And that went really well, so they said, ooh, let's try that again. So they did Batman Returns. And that went well, so they said, okay, it's going to be Batman forever. <laughs> now they really stuck to this team because then they created Batman versus Robin. And if you watch that movie, you know that it was the worst superhero movie of all time, right? <laughs> so then you would think, okay, now they're going to start with a clean slate and try something else, right? But no, <laughs> they came up with Batman Begins. But hey, at least this can be excused, because this was a Christian Bale movie. It was done well, right? So then they came up with The Dark Knight, also a good movie. The Dark Knight Rises, also well done, respect. And so then they said, you know, we know people like Batman, and they like Superman. What if we do Batman versus Superman? <laughs> And this movie was so bad, so bad, that one character spares the other because their moms share the same first name. I promise that's not a spoiler. <laughs> <clears throat> so now you would think, okay, they are going to rethink things. But what did they come up with in 2022? It was the Batman. But at this point, you get the picture, and not only that, you have a name for this disease, right? It's obsessive sales disorder. Now I want us to compare this to what Marvel did instead. In the 1990s, Marvel was in trouble. They were on the verge of bankruptcy. They had sold off all of their major characters. They had sold off Spider-Man, X-Men, and there were movies being made that some were good, some were mediocre. They weren't seeing much of anything from those movies. They really needed to rethink things. Fortunately for them, along came Kevin Feige, who rose through the ranks at Marvel, 
And Kevin Feige, who is now their president, he had a vision for Marvel. And his vision was to create movies that were true to Marvel comic books. And I didn't know this until recently, but actually comic books are a profound commentary on society and human issues. And so if you take this Marvel vision, this Kevin Feige vision, and translate it into the radical product thinking approach to a vision statement, here's how it would read. Today when moviegoers who like superheroes want to be entertained and they want to see themselves reflected in these heroes and identify with them, they have to watch superhero movies where they may or may not identify with the character or they have to turn to comics instead. This is unacceptable because we miss out on impacting moviegoers more deeply and bringing awareness of societal and human issues like comic books do. We envision a world where moviegoers can see themselves reflected in a universe of interconnected superhero characters that reflect these societal and human issues. And the way we're bringing about this world is through our movies and characters that are true to these comic books. <clears throat> now this is a good vision because it's detailed, it describes the problem, why it must be solved, and what's the solution. But having a vision is really only the first step. What you need next is a really detailed strategy, and that is where a radical strategy comes in. A radical strategy, or an RDCL strategy, is a mnemonic that helps you think through what's the real pain point. Then you can think through the design capabilities, logistics. Real pain points in this case was, you know, moviegoers, they don't know this universe of characters. They haven't studied comic books. They're not comic buffs but they want to feel like they're insiders. They want to have this know-how and they want to get to know this universe of heroes. And so the solution is to create character development, right? To build out these stories and these little known characters. Nobody knew of these characters like Iron Man and Thor until these movies came out. And think about the interconnected end credit scenes which were often actually, they got more buzz than the entire movie. In terms of capabilities, right, they had to um, enable this interconnected set of stories by buying back some of those characters that they had sold off, like they had sold off Thor and Hulk too. And then in terms of logistics, this is where we think about the business model, your sales channels, etc. Remember that they were on the verge of bankruptcy, right? So they had to make the business model work. So they borrowed 100 mil, um, yes, they borrowed 500 million to make 10 movies, and they had to get the right kind of actors that would fit within the budget. So think about character, um, actors like Robert Downey Jr., who were talented but not famous at the time. So you have a good strategy, you have a vision. That's when you need to translate it into a set of priorities, right? And into a roadmap. Typically, we often want to assign priorities, just saying, this is priority one, two, and three. But instead, in a vision-driven world, you share your priorities by explaining your rationale for the right trade-off between the long-term and the short-term, right? That's essentially how, as a product person, how, as a leader, you're intuitively prioritizing. You're always balancing long-term versus short-term. So let's make that explicit for our teams by drawing that up on an X and a Y axis, by drawing up vision, like is this good for the vision or not, and is this good for survival or not? And so, what did this mean for Marvel? Right? They started by investing in the vision, meaning it was good for the vision, but not that great for survival in the short term. So, they invested a vision in the vision by testing if movies can be successful without all these big-named characters, by creating all these movies with, you know, B and C-list superhero movie uh, characters like Iron Man, right? So they tested this, that was investing in the vision. Then they had to take on some vision debt. Vision debt is kind of like technical debt, but on the vision side, where you're doing things that are good for the short term, good for survival, but it's not good for the long term, right? So they took out this loan for 10 movies that was vision debt because it was helping survival, but hey, it's not good for the long term vision. And then they did things that were good for both vision and survival, like creating these interconnected stories. And as they were doing things in the ideal quadrant, 
they were able to then invest more in the vision. They went and bought back more characters. And then they could do more things in the ideal ca um, quadrant. They were casting the right characters. And over time, even big named um, talent. They also announced a whole roadmap, right? They announced phases one through four long before these movies came out. But you know, even in this roadmap, right? It's not like they just announced this and they launched this whole strategy in one big bang. What they did was they took a hypothesis-driven approach. And this is where the execution and measurement comes in. You can translate your strategy and every element of your strategy into hypotheses and how you measure success. So here's one of the most important hypotheses they had. Their hypothesis was, it's not important to have A-list characters or A-list actors. What's important is the power of our storytelling. And the way they tested this, by the way, is anyone remember the movie uh, in 1998, Blade? Great, so cult fans, right? So Blade actually was this unknown superhero vampire character. They made it with a 45 million budget and it got a cult following and 130 million box office return. That was how they tested that hypothesis. And taking this vision-driven approach, Marvel has made 10 out of the 30 highest grossing movies of all time. And Kevin Feige has become the highest grossing executive producer of all time. How do you think DC did in comparison? So they have made one of the top 30. Anyone want to take a guess as to what movie that was? You can scream out your answer out loud. What was that? No, but good guess. Was no, not Dark Knight. I would have thought so, but no. No, actually. So now I'll give you the answer because I was just as baffled. I swore I thought it was going to be a Batman movie. But no, it was actually Aquaman. <laughs> Which was exactly my reaction. I said, what? No, why? And you know what? I was doing all of this research with my son. And, and so my son, he looks at me, seriously? Just look at him. <laughs> An insightful kid. <laughs> but the moral of the story, the moral of the story is that you can build radical products. And your radical product is the mechanism for creating the change that you want to bring in the world. And you can do that by very systematically translating a vision for change very step by step into reality. But at this point, it begs the question, you know, everything that you gave an example of so far, vision, strategy, it's from the perspective of a leader, right? What if I'm not in a leadership role? What if I'm not the Kevin Feige of the world and I'm an individual contributor? How do I use radical product thinking? And this is where I want to give you this change in mindset that I want us to think differently about what makes a visionary. You don't have to be Iron Man or somebody like an Elon Musk. That's such a flawed picture of what makes a visionary. You can be a visionary by creating change systematically in whatever path that inspires you. And so whether it's you know parenting, activism, your work, whatever it is, it is your product. And you can take this vision-driven approach. And the example I want to use to illustrate that is the example of Raymond Moriyama, who was an architect, and actually, he just only last month passed away. This story inspired me so much because Raymond's vision was really shaped by his being interned during the Second World War. He was only 12 at the time, and he was in a Japanese, uh, being Japanese, he was put in a prisoner camp. And that really shaped his vision for the world. The change that he envisioned was he felt like democracy is fragile, that you have to fight for the rights not just of yourself, but everybody. And his vehicle for bringing about that change, meaning his product to bring that change, was to create inclusive participatory architecture, an architecture that really brought people together. So how did that manifest in his products? 
One of the earliest things that he built was the Ontario Science Centre in 1967. The critics hated it, actually. Critics said, you know, this is like a carnival, but at a museum. But while critics hated it, actually people loved it for exactly that same reason. But that was just one of his early projects, right? One of the most well-known things he did was the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. And I find it so beautiful, just his vision and how he talked about it, because he said, you know, there will be the obligatory jeeps, tanks, and the medals of valor. But, he said, there will also be a teddy bear once carried by a Canadian army stretcher bearer who was killed in World War II, and it was given to him by his 10-year-old daughter as a good luck charm. And along with that is a letter that his son wrote to him that he never got a chance to read. His vision was that instead of just sharing this, you know, glamour and this, you know, machism of war, war, he wanted to share the human faces of war and the tragedy of war, right? So how did his vision translate into his priorities? He started by investing in the vision. The Ontario Science Centre, that was investing in the vision. He did something that was what he thought good for the vision. Public loved it, it brought people together. Critics hated it, right? It wasn't great for survival. Later, the Canadian War Museum actually was good for both vision and survival. He was really well known for that. But one of the things that he did was also investing in the vision by declining projects. Sometimes you invest in the vision based on what you say no to. And one of the things that he said no to, very famously, was to a famous lawyer and his wife. And his reason was, he said, I listened for 40 minutes and found out they had nice homes and many, many cars and a cottage and boats. And he said to them, OK, you don't need an architect. You need family counseling because an architect can't fuse you together. He realized that in creating that project for them, he would only be taking on vision debt. Right? And so, with that, I leave you with the thought that every one of us can build radical products and create the change that we envision very systematically. We can engineer that change by translating it from vision into strategy, priorities, execution, into a culture that we want. And so lastly, I'll end with this, that if you'd like to learn more, you can get the Radical Product Thinking book. Yesterday at the workshop, someone said, you know, I really wish my company's leaders were here. <laughs> so one of the ways to help bring about a mindset change, if you're ever doing a book club at your company, I'll say this to all of the productized community, feel free to reach out to me. If you're doing a book club, if you're driven by passion, I thrive on passion, and I'll join you for a Q&A session. <laughs> reach out to me if you want. You can ask me about corporate training and workshops. Um, you can get the free toolkit on the Radical Product Thinking website. And lastly, I always love to hear how people are creating the change that inspires them using Radical Product Thinking. So feel free to connect with me, and I'd love to hear from you on LinkedIn. Thank you. Yeah.